Hey everybody, I hope you're all doing well, whatever time it is for you right now, and thank you for watching. So I wanted to record something about the current state of affairs, I suppose we could say, in regards to disclosure. So disclosure means different things to different people, but if we examine where we have gone so far, where exactly are we? You know, how much progress has actually been made? I think it's fair to say that Although the UFO issue has been subject to a global research effort, an effort that has been undertaken by civilians, academics, military officials, and intelligence insiders for decades, this effort, although global in nature, remained primarily on the fringes of society. And really, it's only recently that we've seen this subject move from the fringes and onto the front pages of establishment mainstream media, such as the New York Times and CNN, just to name a couple. And although we have seen prior efforts to push the UFO issue into the public and social political awareness, it is only within the last three years that we've seen this effort made manifest in a tangible way, a way that's translatable to a wider public. Never before have we had officially declassified footage of unidentified flying objects coming out of the US Navy, Pentagon and Department of Defense, with official statements from these entities regarding the unidentifiable nature of the objects alongside Top Gun pilots testifying on mainstream media about their experiences with UFOs that defy our current understanding of physics. Objects that were caught using forward-looking infrared cameras that are attached to some of the most advanced warfighting platforms that the US military has um, at its disposal, the F-18 Super Hornet, piloted by highly trained observers and weapon specialists whose job it is to be able to identify anything in the air that may pose a threat. Not only have we had the acknowledgments by official US government entities that the footage captured is legitimate, back in 2017 we had the acknowledgement of the existence of the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, known as ATIP, which was revealed to be a top-secret Pentagon initiative to track, observe uh, and study UFOs and their effects, with a further purpose of developing novel research and development studies in the hopes of replicating the effects observed from UFOs. On top of this, we had the introduction of Tudor Stars Academy of Arts and Science, founded by former Blink-182 rock star Tom DeLonge, and boasting an impressive list of staff from various areas of defence, aerospace, government and intelligence sectors, including the former director of the Pentagon's ATIP programme, Lou Elizondo, and former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defence for Intelligence, Christopher Mellon. Tudor Stars Academy, or TTSA as it's shortened to's self-proclaimed goal, is one of raising awareness on the fundamental issues of the UFO topic, educating the public via multimedia entertainment, wherein the core issues of the UFO subject are tackled on a more uh, manageable and I suppose entertaining format. This area of the endeavour has started with the Secret Machines and Gods, Man and War book series, as well as the highly popular TV series Unidentified Inside America's UFO Investigation, which is now coming to the end of its second season. And then they have their aerospace sector, wherein they intend to advance the development of exotic technologies and physics concepts that are related to the extraordinary feats exhibited by UFOs such as the Tic Tac craft of the now famous Nimitz incident. We've also had the US Navy officially announce it will be changing its reporting guidelines so that pilots and other crew members can report sightings of UFOs without fear of ridicule or even professional ramifications towards their military careers. We've had the announcements from TTSA that something called the ADAM project was being put into action, ADAM standing for Acquisition and Data Analysis of Materials, the purpose of which was to essentially put the word out that TTSA was looking to acquire anomalous materials, things that could not be explained, and perhaps could be materials from UFO craft, etc. This ADAM project was apparently a success as TTSA managed to acquire a series of anomalous materials, only some of which have we heard partial information about regarding composition and potential anomalous properties or effects. So this is where the discussion of what are classified as metamaterials came into centre stage, and everyone was very excited about the possibility of debris from E.T. Craft, especially after Lou Elizondo told Tucker Carlson on Fox News 
that he believed the US government did indeed have some form of debris or materials from a UFO. With the announcement of the Adam project and the introduction of metamaterials into the public discussion, TTSA claimed to have access to multiple anomalous samples, one sample of particular interest, supposedly sourced from the well-known UFO researcher Linda Moulton Howe, was the small wedge of material composed of micron-thin layers of bismuth, magnesium, and zinc alloys, the isotopic ratios of which showed evidence of re-engineering, as the ratios did not match what we currently understand to be possible as a natural occurrence, and yet the engineering required to achieve these micron layers is currently, according to the professionals, outside the envelope of our technical abilities as humans. This bismuth magnesium zinc metamaterial was reported to promote what is known as a negative index refraction, and when the material was radiated with a specific terahertz frequency, a reduction in mass was achieved through these experiments, albeit a minuscule reduction, only readable with highly sensitive instruments. If this is the case, we still have a long way to go before we can make this particular material totally weightless, but ultimately, we really don't know how far they've come with that material as of yet. Leading on from the introduction of metamaterials into the public conversation, Tudor Stars Academy entered into what is known as a Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, or a CRADA, uh, they entered this with the US Army. This CRADA has been a relatively quiet endeavor in regards to public announcements on any forward progress, and I hope we can expect news regarding these studies in the near future, as um, things such as the bismuth magnesium metamaterial did apparently go into this CRADA uh, for further research, so hopefully we do get further transparency on that as it goes along. TTSA also announced their Scout initiative, the idea is to create an AI computer learning app that can be downloaded and used to track UFOs and subsequently live stream the data to be analysed by the AI in order to ascertain the veracity of the sighting and kind of cross compare it with a big data spread of, of different sightings across the globe. It's an exciting prospect, and although we've had announcements regarding Scout, the most recent of these being TTSA's hiring of Joe Sherman as a leader in the Scout initiative, other than this, it has actually been relatively quiet, and it's looking as if civilian efforts that draw upon similar sources and methods regarding the use of AI learning platforms to track and analyze UFO data might just race ahead of TTSA when it comes to this type of new technology and ability being made available to the public. The most notable civilian effort um, within this sector of study would be Skyhub. Uh, this is a public UAP tracking and data analysis effort that utilizes AI machine learning, and this has been set up by one Stephen McDaniel. This is something that uh, Bob McGuire, Science Bob, is also a, a member of and uh, a big supporter of Skyhub. Now, we also had the announcement that a select group of senators had received classified briefings on the UFO issue and that the president had also received a similar briefing. We don't know the exact nature of these briefings, but I think it's safe to assume it had a lot to do with national security, sovereignty, uh, and airspace. No doubt they were briefed on specific incursions over sensitive military sites uh, and training areas. Uh, they were most likely briefed on the Nimitz and Princeton events to a higher degree. We have also had mention via a series of unclassified studies that came through the Pentagon's ATIP program that as well as studying the proposed technological advances and physics concepts required to match the capabilities exhibited by UFOs, the program, and this is the ATIP program, also dedicated time to what was categorized as field effects, uh, and more, more specifically field effects on biological tissue or human effects. Uh, this study was revealed to have been working and looking extensively into the biological effects that take place with humans who are exposed in some way to UFOs or, or some aspect of the phenomenon. You know, this is something that Dr. Hal Puthoff also addressed in his most recent public conference at the 2020 transition talk in February. Hal Puthoff appeared to be using old slides during this presentation from the Pentagon's ATIP program, including slides on the human effects of UAP exposure. 
and uh, you know this this led into um, him talking about the different electromagnetic and ultraviolet frequencies and how these things may interact with human tissue so uh, i think this is quite an important area which i i would like to think might actually be addressed in in further research and further mainstream media publications it'd be great to see a new york times article on the field effects on biological tissue Recently, we've also heard news that the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee voted on the passing of a bill that will essentially force the Defense Department to share information it's collected on UFOs with respective intelligence agencies and that extensive reports are to be then made publicly available. So the demand for transparency on UFO data was inserted into the overall defense budget documents under the Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021 which, if I'm correct, uh, requires a sign-off by the President of the United States in order for that to be actionable. Due to the UFO transparency bill being a part of the overall defense budget, I personally think it's unlikely that this bill will not be passed. And so this, in my opinion, is a very strong step uh, forward regarding future transparency on the UFO issue via interagency collaboration and then eventual dissemination efforts that make their way to the public. And then only a few weeks ago, investigative journalists Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal dropped yet another bombshell article into the New York Times, this time covering entirely new ground for the mainstream, which is the subject of UFO crash retrievals and crash retrieval programs. Up until now, within the mainstream discussion on the UFO issue, I think the closest we've probably come to reporting on the idea of anything related to crash retrievals was the discussion surrounding the metamaterials. It was not within the discussion parameters at the time, but now times do appear to have changed a little bit at least. There's a small shift into a new direction. And the idea that the US government or even corporate entities operating outside of government purview and oversight could be operating UFO crash retrieval programs with the intention of material acquisition for further research and development into you know, novel exotic physics technologies and, and different uh, technological breakthroughs. This idea is now starting to enter center stage, and I think that this is where we will see the conversation begin to escalate and perhaps see the momentum behind it increase. The most recent news to come from the US government is the official announcement of what is being called the UAP Task Force. The announcement was uh, posted on the official Department of Defense website, and it reads as follows. On August the 4th, 2020, Deputy Secretary of Defense David L. Norquist approved the establishment of an unidentified aerial phenomena, brackets UAP, task force, brackets UAPTF. The Department of the Navy, under the cognizance of the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, will lead the UAPTF. The Department of Defense established the UAPTF to improve its understanding of and gain insight into the nature and origins of UAPs. The mission of the task force is to detect, analyze, and catalog UAPs that could potentially pose a threat to US national security. As DOD has stated previously, the safety of our personnel and the security of our operations are of paramount concern. The Department of Defense and the military departments take any incursions by unauthorized craft into our training ranges or designated airspace very seriously and examine each report. This includes examinations of incursions that are initially reported as UAP when the observer cannot immediately identify what he or she is observing. Now, I'm actually in communication with one of the intelligence members who has been appointed to a high position within the UAP task force. They have been reassigned from their previous role within intelligence and are now a part of this overall effort. And so I hope that this will put me in a position to be able to um, to be able to ascertain certain details. I don't expect them to be revealing, uh, you know, sensitive information. Obviously, regarding the most recent endeavor from the Pentagon with UAPs, um, but they have made me aware, and this is someone that I've been in contact with for a while. They have made me aware that this has been a position that they have been reassigned to in regards to the UAPTF. So what what that means. In relation to me knowing anything, I, I honestly don't know. I would be highly doubtful that I would be given inside information prior to publicly, you know, things things going public. 
but it's something that I've been made aware of very recently. So I thought I would let you all know that this is actually something that's become a development in, in my particular journey. So where does this leave us in the long run? So far, the leading topics of discussion within the mainstream are the creation of the UAP task force and the idea that the US government or some other entity may have engaged in or are still engaging in UFO crash retrieval programs. And this is a big deal, but the question really is now where is it going to go from here? One issue I think is extremely important to bring up, uh, and this is the fact that this is not a global media initiative uh, regarding the coverage. There has been almost zero coverage of this issue in the UK mainstream media from 2017 onwards. Really, the only meaningful bit of coverage in the UK on this issue came about in the last week with the UK LBC radio host Majid Nawaz speaking with former MOD official Nick Pope. Uh, and this was about all of the most recent developments that have taken place since the initial 2017 ATIP story. Uh, other than this, the UK media has been essentially silent. And so I sincerely hope that Majid's coverage of this issue will give others within the UK media uh, you know, essentially permission by proxy to do so as well. I know from many of my subscribers that the same media silence can be found all across Europe and beyond, so we're not seeing this travel across all corners of the globe via the news. And although there are, of course, pressing concerns, for example, the global pandemic um, and many other issues that are facing us, I still cannot help but be extremely surprised and even a little disturbed by the glaringly obvious media vacuum regarding the UFO topic. Now in America it's a completely different reality. To many other countries across the, across the entire world, you know, it's a completely different reality regarding the coverage. Uh, my country even has, and this is the UK, it has what it's referred to as a special relationship with the US, and yet we apparently do not share the same obligations when it comes to reporting on this fundamentally important issue. Uh, something many of the skeptics would say is that if this was real, it would be all over the world news and everyone would know about it. And I've heard people say that before. But as we can see, the reality of is, is far from this. It, we are seeing bubbles or pockets of media coverage concentrated solely in America. And uh, in my opinion, this does need to change. There needs to be a concerted effort amongst researchers and especially European researchers to contact local and nationwide media platforms and encourage them to report on this topic honestly and accurately. Um, I'm currently in the process of writing an extensive letter. I'll be sending this to numerous UK media platforms, essentially just in the hopes of stimulating some engagement on this topic. Um, and I would highly encourage others to do the same. But despite the lack of global coverage, um, if I was to speculate and be optimistic, I would say that we will still see more insider testimony. I think more people will start coming out of the black programs. I think this will lead to congressional hearings and subsequent investigations, which could then lead to further dislodging of currently classified and stovepiped information on the UFO issue. I don't think we're going to see reverse engineered craft rolling out of S4 and have the CNN news crews basically waiting outside. I don't think we can really expect that type of disclosure. I think this is just as much a civilian effort as it is a government and political effort. We need to do our part in becoming informed and informing others because without a mass populist interest and a subsequent demand for more transparency, it, it may be decided that this is simply not in the best interests of the status quo to maintain course. I think that there is only so far this official effort can go. Um, and I would love to be wrong. Perhaps I will be proven wrong and I'd be happy to be proven wrong. But I feel that the official government end of this is simply one part of an almost natural evolution process. Of course, I understand the secrecy isn't natural. The decades of cover-up is not a natural part of evolution. But even so, we're now seeing a human race that although has many faults and is still causing untold pain and harm to itself and to its planet. It's also beginning to grasp the complex ideas that are required in order to, at least to some degree, understand the level of technology that these UFOs are working on. And our physics, are, are you know, both theoretical and practical, are evolving to encompass a wider understanding of the fundamental nature of reality, which 
in turn is paving the way for greater innovations in technology and overall energy. We have endeavours such as the Sapphire Project, public, civilian efforts to create breakthrough energy paradigms. It seems as though in many ways, and in many sectors, there is a sense of change, a sense of a shift into something new. And perhaps, even though the UFO secrecy has not appeared to be natural, in a more cosmic sense, it has actually begun to unfold at the exact right time. Because maybe, and this is just a maybe, we are now at a place in the human story where we can begin to understand and integrate these larger ideas and more advanced concepts of physics, energy, technology and consciousness into a new model of reality. And if we form a new model of reality, perhaps this will in of itself precipitate a new model of society. And maybe this really is the absolute right time. It's not always easy to see. You know, there's been many moments in my life, and I'm sure in yours too, where a situation or feeling I was experiencing or you were experiencing did not feel good at the time or felt unnecessary. And yet, upon reflection, further down the line, you realise it was absolutely necessary. You know, perhaps we're seeing this exact thing on a macro scale. Not only with the UFO topic, but with many other pressing issues that are now in the forefront. And perhaps the cumulative effect of human evolution and ingenuity has opened us up enough to be able to digest, at least to some degree, the vastness of the universe, uh, its, its fundamental forces, and the undeniable reality that this universe is teeming with life. You know, for me personally, I have to consider where I go from here. You know, what is most important to me? What does my heart tell me I should be doing? Well, without a doubt, Project Unity is, is where my heart is. But I also need to consider where I go consciously. You see, I'm in somewhat of a difficult position. As someone who has successfully initiated contact, I'm an easier target for dismissal by many so-called intellectuals and academics who essentially see non-locality, the non-local aspect of consciousness, as a complete absurdity. Um, yet, I know this is not the case from entirely a personal perspective, and I believe there is sufficient evidence out there for you to realize that at least to some degree there is a non-local functionality to consciousness. This is real. I have to think about my own journey, you know, and, and what I want to bring to the world. Consciousness to me, it is the most important component, the most overlooked, the most understated and, and the most misrep misrepresented. Even by, and, and to be honest, even maybe especially by people within the UFO community. Uh, you know, I think I want to teach people primarily about consciousness in some format. But I don't know what that means right now. I think it means I want to be able to articulate what I have understood thus far. Um, and what I believe has allowed me to have successful contact. I want to share what I feel I know with people. And... You know, the consciousness and the UFO subject, they bleed into each other. They completely um, merge into each other. And so that's why my initial journey into understanding consciousness did lead into me understanding to some degree the UFO subject and, and became, you know, one of the, the primary works around Project Unity. So it all works together. Um, but, you know, I want to share what I feel I know with people and I can only do what I feel is right and when I gauge my heart against my work they are in in symbiosis you know I, I love what I do and so far I feel I'm doing good unto others and I think that's I think that's what life's about you know simply it's it's being good to people being the difference you want to see being made um, you know being love basically the hardest thing to do is, is to love at all times, but it's, um, it's what we should all strive for, ultimately, because in love lies the highest and, and most exquisite rewards of life, I think. You know, when your mind, body and soul are coherent, clear, unified, you know, this seems to be when life works most efficiently for you. 
So I think my parting words would be don't look for excuses not to be loving. Strive to be someone who seeks the exact opposite. It's all you can do in the face of such gigantic global issues. You know, you can't bring them down with your fists. You can't bring them down all on your own. And being unhappy about it all day and complaining about it all day just doesn't help anyone. The only thing that you can honestly do, and in my opinion, it is the most powerful thing, is bring love into this world as often as you can. Because we all know it needs it. And with that, I just want to say thank you for listening. Please remember to like and subscribe. If you haven't already, um, hit the notification bell if you don't want to miss any content. And you can also support Project Unity via Patreon and gain access to a private Discord server. It's a fun group. Lots of ideas and interesting links to different research topics are always popping up. Um, And so if you want to join the community Discord, you can find the link to the Project Unity Patreon in the description box of this video. Thanks again for watching, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.